Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions, economy, jobs and fair work. And question number one is from Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making with keeping decommissioning jobs in Scotland. Uh, Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Our, our commitment and approach to the opportunities presented by decommissioning are clearly aligned in the uh, programme for government. On behalf of Scottish Ministers, Scottish Enterprise are developing a decommissioning action plan which should be published by the end of this calendar year. And at our instruction, Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise are carrying out work to identify potential sites for investment with a view to increasing capacity for larger decommissioned units to come ashore at our ports and harbours. It's important to recognise uh, that decommissioning the topside infrastructure is a relatively small share of their overall contract value. And many Scottish supply chain companies are very active in the decommissioning market, but we hope to support them going further. Our transition training fund is also available to help those made redundant from the oil and gas industry retrain for opportunities that may arise in decommissioning. And the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work and I uh, will be chairing a meeting with North Sea operators involved in decommissioning projects later this month to better understand the opportunities and challenges facing our oil and gas supply chain in maximising the opportunities from decommissioning. Jenny Mara. I note the Minister did not give a commitment to publish the strategy before Christmas, which was what was committed to uh, before. I want to ask him, in that action plan, will there be a high-level working group included in this strategy, strategy, chaired by himself or by the Cabinet Secretary? Is the, is the Minister satisfied with the engagement so far of Scottish Enterprise in the opportunities of decommissioning? I am not convinced, after meetings with Scottish Enterprise, that there is um, a sufficient number of people actually working on this full time. And will the Minister accept my invitation to Dundee to visit the port of Dundee as a potential decommissioning site before Christmas? Minister. Uh, there's a number of issues there, uh, Presiding Officer. On the, um, the role of the high-level working group, we will certainly be the strong level of ministerial engagement in this issue. The Cabinet Secretary, myself, indeed the First Minister, have all been involved in discussions around decommissioning, and I certainly give a commitment to, to Jenny Mara and indeed other members I know who are interested in this issue in the Chamber that there will be a, a, a high level of uh, ministerial engagement in the subject. In terms of SE's role, um, I think it should be recognised, and I, th I would hope Jenny Mara will uh, be pleased to know that um, according to companies who are involved in the sector, including Maersk, uh, who have already said in response to UK, uh, Oil and Gas UK board meeting, that uh, the Scottish supply chain is already capturing much of the offshore decommissioning work. And indeed, I'm aware that the Brent field uh, decommissioning work going on there, the vast majority of the work, uh, particularly the uh, plugging and abandonment work that's being done, is being captured by the Scottish supply chain. So there are great successes there. Perhaps they're not as visible as we'd all like them to be. And that's one aspect we need to improve to make sure that the industry is recognised for the work it's doing on decommissioning. Uh, but Scottish Enterprise have been very much active in that and are supporting a number of innovative companies in Scotland to uh, innovate for the decommissioning market and I've indeed I've visited uh, a number of those myself. As regards Dundee, uh, I've also been invited to uh, visit uh, Dundee Harbour by Joe Fitzpatrick but I'm more than happy to, to visit Dundee at some point in the near future and to meet with the member to discuss what possibilities there are to exploit uh, decommissioning in the city of Dundee. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Minister how many people anticipates will be employed decommissioning Hunters and B nuclear power station when it eventually closes? And how many years does he believe it will take to complete that decommissioning? Minister. Uh, the, 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 certainly, this is an important question. I appreciate it's a slightly different subject from uh, the, that intended by Jenny Mara, but decommissioning activity, which has been undertaken in the nuclear sector, does lend some skill sets which would be transferable to uh, decommissioning more generally in the oil and gas sector. I know that there's at least one company I've spoken to who have expressed an interest in project management in that sphere. It is difficult to estimate at this point in time the um, exact nature of the, the jobs that would be sustained in decommissioning Hunterston B. Experience with existing decommissioning sites in Scotland would suggest employment levels of several hundred for about 20 to 25 years. And the Scottish Government is working with Scottish Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland and other partners to help increase Scotland's skill capacity in nuclear decommissioning. Uh, we do know from uh, work that's been undertaken in Chapel Cross uh, where 280 workers were employed in that capacity and 200 at Hunterston A. But these are different technologies and therefore different solutions might be required for decommissioning at Hunterston B. Maurice Golden. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I refer members to my register of interest with respect to my work in the oil and gas uh, decommissioning sector with Zero Waste Scotland, uh, particularly producing the report of Offshore Oil and Gas Decommissioning, uh, which was launched uh, just a little over a year ago. And I too recognise concerns uh, from Jenny Mara over Scottish Enterprises' commitment to this area, but I would I'd like to ask the Scottish Government if they will consider investment in an upgrade in port facilities, more likely in Neg or Shetland, so that Scotland has the ability to decommission a platform recovered via single lift, as opposed to some of the large piece or small piece decommissioning options that are available. Yes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, certainly, I, I would want to defend the role of Scottish Enterprise and indeed Highlands Isles Enterprise, who are very active in this area at this moment in time, looking uh, to help us identify what portside investment opportunities there may be to capitalise on uh, the, uh, the, the funding that's available for decommissioning. I would just refer the member to my, my initial answer, which stressed that uh, we are working with both organisations to, uh, to filter through the number of interested ports and harbours who are looking to capitalise this, but also emphasise the point, as I made in response to Jenny Mara, that uh, the vast majority of contract value is thankfully being secured by the Scottish sector and the port side um, uh, removal of the top side uh, infrastructure is a relatively small share of the total contract value, but it is an important share and we'll obviously do what we can to try and secure that as well. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. In addition to the transition fund, which doesn't um, help workers keep their current skills up to date, Will the Minister consider the possibility of establishing a job retention fund for oil workers, which could assist with refresher courses for skilled workers, which can personally cost them between three and four hundred pounds? Well, I'd obviously be keen to hear from Elaine Smith if there are specific uh, examples of individuals who are requiring support that we've been unable to assist through the TTF to look at whether the criteria um, are working as effectively as they like. But um, I would emphasise that we, we need to be very careful in terms of making sure that we, we help those who are uh, most immediately threatened by redundancy, who are actually facing redundancy, rather than um, those who perhaps are still within the sector, but I recognise would be looking to maybe divert their skills into other areas which might have more growth potential. Uh, but the TTF is being uh, taken up very well now. We are seeing a high level of spend through the fund, and I, I believe it is having an impact to help a growing number of individuals affected by the downturn in the industry. Gillian Martin. I'm glad to hear members mention the Transition Training Fund. I hosted an event with them yesterday and I hope that members got a chance to visit them. Aside from uh, de decommissioning jobs, does the Minister agree with the Oil and Gas Authority on the high remaining potential in the North Sea following a strong licensing round and, the, and welcome the arrival of new entrants into the region? What representations will the Minister make to the UK Government ahead of the autumn statement calling on exploration and development to be incentivised? Yes, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, well, I had, had attended this week the Mayor UK meeting in London where, uh, amongst other things, I raised the uh, contact that the Cabinet Secretary had made with Greg Hand before the reshuffle of the UK Government uh, to emphasise the need for loan guarantees to be brought forward as soon as possible to help free up uh, balance sheets, particularly the smaller, uh, smaller independent operators in the North Sea, to allow them to uh, release resource, to, to allow them to, to undertake more exploration. I am very encouraged by the high take-up of the licensing round. I think that shows a continued interest and investment in the UK continental shelf. And uh, that is encouraging at a time when there's perhaps a, a tendency to be all doom and gloom about the future of the oil and gas industry. There are companies that are growing at this present moment in time in the oil and gas industry. And uh, what we need to do is try and help individuals to access the opportunities that arise from that and transfer their skills into those productive areas. Question number two, Elaine Smith. Thank you. And can I declare an interest as a member of Unite the Union to ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to reduce youth unemployment? Minister Jamie Hepburn. The Scottish Government is committed to reducing 2014 levels of youth unemployment by 40% by 2021 through the actions set out in developing the young workforce Scotland's youth employment strategy. Youth unemployment fell by 9,000 from the strategy's baseline figure of 52,000 in January to March 2014. The Developing Young Workforce Programme reports in progress annually, and the second annual report will be published later in the year. Elaine Smith. I thank the Minister for that response, Presiding Officer. And clearly, 
within that apprenticeship is an important vehicle to help reduce youth unemployment, but what can the Minister do to address inequalities in that, such as young women being paid considerably less than male counterparts and more likely to be unemployed at the end of their apprenticeship? And further, can the Minister tell us how many young women on modern apprenticeships are ineligible for statutory maternity pay due to the low youth rates of pay, which is a point that has been raised with me by Unite the Union? Minister Jamie Hepburn. Well, certainly, uh, I would say in relation to the last point, I'll always be very willing to hear from any trade union about any particular concern uh, they have and to uh, respond to that. But uh, and more broadly, uh, I would uh, certainly concur with the, uh, the point that was being made inherent within uh, Lane Smith's question that there is much more we need to do uh, in relation to ensuring that uh, women are uh, better represented in terms of our modern apprenticeship offer. Uh, they're not alone. There are others with... Uh, protect the characteristic, characteristics that we need to do more in relation to. That's why uh, we've tasked uh, Skills Development Scotland with uh, its taking forward its Equalities Action Plan, and it's doing that right now. Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that all local authorities work to deliver the Scottish living wage. Minister. Well, this is, of course, uh, a very well-timed uh, question uh, because, uh, President Officer, this is, of course, Living Wage Week, which the uh, First Minister uh, kicked off by announcing on Monday the new rate of £8.45 uh, uh, per hour. I'm very pleased that uh, all local authorities in Scotland currently uh, pay the living wage to their uh, own staff, and, of course, that uh, is very welcome. It uh, goes uh, along with the other range of activities we take to promote the living wage through uh, Commission the Poverty Alliance to promote the accreditation scheme, we now have 630 uh, accredited living wage employers in Scotland, some 20% of the UK total. And that might be why uh, Scotland has the highest percentage of the workforce paid at least the living wage of the four constituent nations of the UK. Neil Findlay. Uh, the inflexible way in which uh, Skills Development Scotland manage their grants is causing real problems for the Blackburn Local Employment Scheme in my region. Last week at question time, the First Minister said that the Cabinet Secretary would meet with uh, me and representatives from BLESS to try and resolve this issue, but since then I have had no contact uh, from the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, when can we make this meeting happen? Is it is a matter of urgency? And all we need is some flexibility in the way in which they deal with their grants, and we could ensure that we can help yet more of the young people in that area, more than the 3,000 who have already been helped. Minister. I, I know this is an issue that uh, Neil Finlay, amongst others, uh, have uh, taken up. Uh, Fiona Hislop, who is the constituency representative, has also uh, written to me on uh, this matter. I understand that the Cabinet Secretary has written uh, to Mr Finlay, and uh, I'm sure he'll be getting back in due course. Question number three, Graham Day. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how much investment Scotland has received from EU structural and investment funding, and how many jobs this has supported. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, Scotland has received around €4.75 billion Euro in structural funds since the policy began in 1975. Uh, and these funds have helped build digital networks, roads, harbours and causeways, invested in urban regeneration and business premises and supported skills and training. Every seven-year programme, of course, is uh, slightly different and has a different focus. And it's not possible to estimate the total number of jobs since 1975. However, the 2007-13 programmes were worth £750 million and supported 99,107 people into work, created 44,311 jobs and provided business support to over 80,000 SMEs. The 2014-20 programmes are worth a further €940 million, Euro, around £800 million to Scotland. Graham Day. I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for that reply, which I think lays bare the damage that Scotland being dragged out of the EU against its will would have. Uh, and I wonder if he would agree with me that the continued uncertainty surrounding Brexit is already putting potential investment in Scotland by business at risk. Cabinet Secretary. I would certainly agree, and I think if he talks to colleagues in the education sector, especially higher and further education, he will know that that's the case. Uh, leaving the EU, of course, is likely to weaken the economy. According to the UK government's own analysis, leaving the single market could lower Scotland's GDP by more than £10 billion. Our starting point is to protect our relationship with the EU. We're considering all possible options to ensure Scotland's continuing relationship with and place in the European Union. And just to say, in addition to the jobs and financial benefits that we've received, I believe we might be benefit massively from being a more rich and diverse country because of our membership of the European Union. David Stewart. 
Thank you, President Officer. Could I seek assurances from the Cabinet Secretary that ring fence funding allocations and targeted benefits to the Highlands and Islands as a transition region will be honoured by the Scottish Government? There is, of course, major uncertainties in this post-referendum pre-Brexit phase, but will Highlands and Islands businesses and agencies be supported and not disadvantaged? Cabinet Secretary. Of course, David Shute will know that's exactly our aim in the Scottish Government. There have been a number of statements made already by my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance. I'm sure he will say something else specifically on this very shortly, and perhaps David Shute would give us the benefit of waiting until that statement is made. But we share the same aim to make sure that uh, SMEs and individuals in the Highlands are not penalised by any reduction in terms of either the ring fenced or other European funding which may be coming to them. So we share the same aim, and I think we're making very good progress to making sure that assurance can be given. Kate Forbes. European funding has been enormously beneficial in creating jobs in the Highlands, as has been touched on with bodies like the Highlands and Islands Enterprise particularly receiving European grants. Can the Cabinet Secretary assure my constituents that Highlands and Islands Enterprise will continue to be supported for the work it does in creating jobs and economic growth in the Highlands? Cabinet Secretary. We, of course, recognise the different social, economic and community development chances, uh, challenges that face the Highlands and Islands. Uh, and we are determined to maintain dedicated support, which is locally based and managed and directed by HIE. Of course, uh, the member will be aware of the First Minister's own statement that the agency itself, HIE, will remain in place uh, as an NDPB. The Scottish Government believes that future budget provisions, of course, will be sufficient to meet Highlands and Islands enterprise funding needs, as well as allowing it to meet its obligations and, of course, to maintain the capacity to support key sectors. Question number four, Gordon Lindhurst. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to show that Scotland is open for business with non-EU countries. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government is building on the ambitious internationalisation agenda set out in Scotland's trade and investment strategy in March this year. In order to make clear uh, that Scotland is open for business both with Europe and, of course, with the rest of the world, uh, we are establishing a ministerial-led trade board to bring together business interests and further developing the Global Scots Network. We are appointing trade envoys to champion export market opportunities. And Scottish Government agencies are working to help more Scottish businesses to become exporters and to attract inward investment into Scotland. We are also opening innovation and investment hubs in Dublin, London and Brussels. I appreciate that relates to the EU and also into Berlin, as well as doubling the number of SDI staff across Europe. So the Scottish Government is engaging directly with businesses following the EU referendum to listen to concerns, provide reassurance and reiterate that Scotland remains open for business. Gordon Linders. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. The First Minister has made clear her efforts to boost trade with the EU in the wake of the EU referendum result uh, through measure, measures such as uh, have been just referred to. However, less than half, or 42% of Scotland's exports were destined for the EU in 2014, a decline of £985 million on the previous year, while the largest export destination by country for Scottish exports is the United States of America. There is considerable trade growth potential in the huge world market provided by 7 billion people as compared to the EU's 500 million. Will the Scottish Government commit to new specific measures to increase Scotland's trade influence in other parts of the world than the EU together with the UK Government post-Brexit? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, that, we do commit to do that. I think that was evident from a first answer. Uh, so, for example, engagement uh, in Kazakhstan coming up shortly, uh, in the Middle East, of course, in terms of our oil and gas industry. Um, in addition to that, of course, we have substantial, uh, a substantial presence in both uh, the US and China, and we want to build on that. It's an interesting point about the UK government, because I think Gordon uh, Lindhurst's question acknowledges for the first time in the Conservative benches that there are two governments involved in the economy of Scotland. Last week, not one single Conservative member would concede the fact that the UK government shares the responsibility for the economic performance of Scotland. So I'm pleased that Gordon Lindhurst does that. And I've also made it clear to Liam Fox when I met with him that we are happy and keen to work jointly. There are areas where it makes sense for us to do so and we don't duplicate our efforts. So, for example, I've had a, a meeting with the, a, a large group of a, a chief executive officers from India. We've done that in conjunction with the UK government. We're happy to do that. It takes two to do that. And I'm waiting to hear more from Liam Fox as to how we can uh, encourage that. And the point I would make about Kazakhstan, which happens next year, on that occasion, we have uh, decided to work with the UK government because that can produce the best results. So we're happy to do that, but it takes two to tango. 
Gordon MacDonald. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that if we had the powers to reinstate post-study work visas, we would give the message that Scotland is open for business to people with skills who are able to contribute greatly to the Scottish economy? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, this is one of those areas where you would hope the joint working between the Scottish Government and the UK Government could produce a, a beneficial effect. Even if the UK Government did not want to continue with post-study work visas uh, throughout the rest of the UK, if they would allow Scotland, working with the Scottish Government, us to do that. Of course, we saw a similar constraint in the US, which was quickly changed because they realised the damage it does economically to the country if you're not going to have the opportunity for people who, work, who study in Scotland to continue to work in Scotland. And I think the return of the visa would be an important important economic lever to Scotland and would send a clear message around the world that Scotland is open for business. Jackie Bailey. We all care about increasing exports, but in evidence to the Economy Committee, a number of independent experts told us that the greatest potential for growth in exports actually lay with proximity to our nearest market. So what is the Scottish Government doing to increase exports to the rest of the UK, Scotland's largest and nearest export market? What new initiatives is the Scottish Government bringing forward? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I've detailed some of those in my previous answer. Our nearest market is actually the EU. We are in the EU single market. That is our new, that's the market we're actually in. Um, so I think if you acknowledge that fact, if you can do a bit of work on this, uh, um, I would suggest, uh, President Officer, for Jackie Bailey, this is the market we're in, and we are trying to defend our position in this market. Unfortunately, what we've got in the case of the Labour Party, Scottish Labour, is trying to provide political cover for their friends and better together in the Brexiteers by trying to talk up that aspect. But from my point of view, what I am keen to do, of course, is to increase the activity and the trade we have with the rest of the UK and to increase the activity we have in the EU. And as a last answer to the last question just highlighted around the world as well, I don't see that those things should conflict with each other. We should all be supporting all three of those aims. Apologies to members whose questions I couldn't take. We turn to finance and the constitution. Question number one, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the Treasury and what matters were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Last met the Chief Secretary to the Treasury at the Finance Minister's quadrilateral meeting on the 24th of October. We discussed the prospects for the Chancellor's autumn statement and areas of common interest in relation to the economy, public finances and Brexit. I will shortly write to the Finance Committee to provide further details on the key points of the meeting. I use the opportunity to once again call on the UK Government to end austerity and address the economic uncertainty following the EU referendum. At the meeting, the Chief Secretary confirmed HMT agreement to approve the Scottish Government's request for AMI cover for the Scottish Growth Scheme and to increase the budget exchange limit for financial transactions to 15%. I, along with my counterparts from Wales and Northern Ireland, also reiterated our concerns about the UK Government's approach to public finances and the economy and asked for a commitment to bring forward an economic stimulus whilst not reducing current devolved settlements. I will continue making these points directly to UK Ministers, including at the Joint Exchequer Committee tomorrow. Stuart sure, McMillan. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Uh, the progress in the growth scheme is very much welcome, but can the Cabinet Secretary expand further on what the position of the UK Government is uh, and also what position they may take on potentially reopening Scotland's current constitutional agreement? Well, all the devolved administrations in terms of uh, finance made a very clear point that we wouldn't want our finance uh, settlement to be reopened negatively. We want a positive fiscal stimulus. And that should be possible considering the fact that the UK government and the Chancellor has moved away from their predecessors' uh, positions on uh, fiscal uh, surplus. Arthur Fraser. Uh, thank you. Well, as we've just heard from the uh, Finance Secretary, the Scottish Government believes that the UK Treasury should be pursuing a policy of fiscal loosening in the autumn statement. How much extra money does the Scottish Government think the Treasury should be borrowing? Cabinet Secretary. We, we ha that's a matter for them in terms of the figures they arrive at, but we have said, we have said that as they abandon their targets, they have failed in terms of their economic policy, that they should turn to borrowing to stimulate the economy. That's a widely held opinion. It's certainly a move that we would uh, welcome, and the more the merrier, Mr Fraser, in terms of resources, resources that can fairly stimulate our economy. And Mr Fraser seems to object. But that seems to be the mood music from the UK government. It appears Mr Fraser may be performing more somersaults in terms of the Tories' economic policies. Question number two, Pauline McNeill. <clears throat> Thank you. 
to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has for local authorities to be given greater fiscal autonomy to raise their own money and manage their local economies. Cabinet Secretary. Our reforms to council tax, including those presently before Parliament, together with lifting of the council tax freeze, are key steps to making local taxation fairer and ensuring local authorities continue to be properly funded. Additionally, we have established an external review of non-domestic rates to report next summer and we will consult with local government on the assignation of a share of income tax and we are engaging stakeholders uh, on local taxation of vacant, derelict and development land. Pauline McNeill. Thank you. Glasgow City Council's budget is being cut by over £130 million over the next two years by the Scottish Government. In fact, it's the biggest cut that Glasgow City Council has ever faced as a council. But the Scottish Government seems to be passing on a bigger share of cuts to Glasgow than have been passed on to them by the UK Government for some reason. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of the impact of delays in setting the Scottish budget on councils like Glasgow facing unprecedented cuts and the effect particularly on the third sector providing vital services for the most vulnerable. When can the Scottish Government provide some certainty and fairness for Glasgow and is it not time for some devolution of power so Glasgow can manage a bit of its own economy? Cabinet Secretary. Well I'm very happy to engage with COSLA and local government more widely around the devolution of further powers and I think a good example of this working in practice is around the city deal of course where Glasgow is a rather substantial uh, beneficiary and we want that to work that is over a billion pounds uh, of investment of course totally discounted uh, in the in the comments it's been made around the wider local government settlement but this government has protected uh, local government uh, over the period of real terms reductions from uh, UK government in terms of distribution in terms of distribution, that's a matter uh, jointly discussed with uh, COSLA. And I would, encourage, I would encourage councils like Glasgow to consider their position in relation to COSLA so that local government can speak with one voice and arrive at a decision on these matters uh, in partnership. Marie Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can local authorities be flexible in the way they apply second home council tax in order to meet the needs of their communities? Secretary. Yes, in essence they can. The, the recent regulations that we've been able to take through will allow further flexibility in relation to council tax uh, discounts for second homes, including the, varying the level of discount between uh, zero and 50 per cent. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us whether he's still open-minded to the idea of a tourist tax, a tax which local authorities could apply within their own local areas and retain 100% of the tax receipts for in order to fight the cuts? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think that that's a, a fair question. A, a, number, a small number of local authorities have approached me about this issue and I am engaging with COSLA about the basket of local taxes. Whilst we have no plans to introduce such a tax, I think it is worthy of discussion and I'll have those discussions with local authorities and those local authorities who are interested in such a levy. Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As part of the proposed reforms to council tax, the government agreed to improve support for households with children. How many children stand to benefit from the increase in the child allowance within the council tax reduction scheme? Cabinet Secretary. The increase in the child allowance within the council tax reduction scheme uh, by 25% will benefit up to 77 households by an average of £173 per year and help nearly 140,000 children. Uh, question three has not been lodged. Question four, Ivan McKee. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that its procurement process uh, policy delivers best value. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish model of procurement has value for money at its heart and importantly sees this as an important balance of cost, quality and sustainability. The need to achieve that balance informs our approach to procurement and is increasingly being recognised internationally as an exemplar of good practice. Ivan McKee. 
thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Scottish Baby Box is a fantastic initiative. It involves a spend of approximately £6 million per year and therefore also offers a potential additional benefit of creating jobs in manufacturing and supply. Tot Spots in my constituency is one such business looking forward to tendering to manufacture nappies for the Baby Box, thus creating jobs in a deprived area of Glasgow. Can the Cabinet Secretary assure me that every effort will be made to ensure companies like Tot Spots and others will have an opportunity to play a role in this excellent initiative, creating jobs in Scotland in the process? Cabinet Secretary. Well, presiding Officer, I'm not about to award contracts uh, through uh, oral parliamentary questions, but I can say the short answer is yes, insofar as procurement uh, rules will allow. And, uh, of course, there are many potential advantages to the baby box, including uh, in its uh, procurement. James Kelly. Thank you. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would agree with me that procurement policy should be used to improve the, the rights of workers. Does he therefore uh, share my disappointment that only 0.2% of Scottish companies have signed up to the business pledge, which can be used to secure the living wage and no zero hour contracts for workers? And what steps will he take to extend the number of companies that sign up to this important pledge? Cabinet Secretary. I agree with Mr Kelly. There is uh, an, an ambition to expand the number of those signing up to the business pledge. I think we can all reflect on how we can encourage more to take up uh, that uh, pledge. Certainly when I visit businesses, I, I ask them, are they, are they supportive of it? And are there any elements that they need further encouragement of? So I think we should all give further consideration to the promotion of the business pledge to get as much uh, good work out of that as possible. And certainly the government will continue to be active in uh, promoting this particular policy for all the social and ethical and economic uh, benefits that it brings. Question number five, David Stewart. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making with the Scottish public sector green ICT strategy. Cabinet Secretary. The Green ICT Strategy, published in May 2015, provides guidance for the public sector to contribute to this government's wider climate change targets. It aligns with the assessment tools developed as part of the amendments to the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009, specifically the secondary legislation, the climate change due to the public bodies reporting requirements, Scotland Order 2015. These are reported annually, beginning in November 2016. We've also included green ICT principles into the Digital First Standards published in May 2016, which set minimum levels for delivering digital public services. These standards apply to all digital public services being created in and by central government. An assessment process is due to be rolled out in early 2017 and will be augmented and improved over time. David Stewart. A recent Audit Scotland report of NHS 24 found delays of implementation in the new IT system. The report reads, and I quote, in 2009, NHS 24 began work on its future programme. The programme's objective was to improve patient experience by modernising NHS 24's call telephone and online technology. The implementation of the new system, originally scheduled for June 2013, is still not complete. Given this and its year-long delays in other IT projects, how will the Scottish Government be able to meet its goals in establishing newer, greener infrastructure? Secretary. Well, I think that uh, I can report to the Chamber that we have made progress in the monitoring uh, arrangements around uh, such uh, projects and I think it will give us better checks and balances, stronger procurement and, and greater and deeper expertise and I am happy to share some of that information in writing with Mr Stewart if he would find that helpful and hopefully reassure him that our processes are a far more robust in learning some of the, the, the lessons from the mistakes from the past. Morris Golden. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to ask the Scottish Government in relation to the recent award by the Scottish Government of a £48 million framework agreement for the supply of IT consumables. How was the ICT life cycle impact mapped, as well as the disposal of these IT consumables incorporated into the specification, along with the scoring award criteria for this contract? Well, can I thank Mr Golden for that question, quite genuinely, a very comprehensive question which truly deserves a comprehensive answer, which I'm happy to do in writing. <laughs> number six, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what savings it expects the Scottish Futures Trust to achieve in delivering projects. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Futures Trust is on course to achieve the objectives set out in its corporate plan for 2014-19 and achieve savings of between £500 million and £750 million. 
Colin Beatty. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the Scottish Futures Trust programme, Scotland Schools for the Future, helped build a new La Suede High School in my constituency. Can you update the Parliament on how the work on the La Suede High School helped inform Scotland Schools for the Future programme subsequently? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the new La Suede Centre was part of a pilot project along with Eastwood High School in East Renfrewshire that saw the government and the two councils work together to jointly procure both schools in a £65 million groundbreaking collaborative initiative that saved £4 million as a result of the partnership approach. Uh, this was the first time that two Scottish councils came together to procure two, two new schools. The initiative has proved successful with the collaborative model being used by other local authorities to achieve benefits and savings across the programme. And it's that kind of working that will uh, inform uh, the onward programme. Question number seven, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether the prompt payment of bills relating to its public contracts has been sustained. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government remains committed to helping businesses by paying invoices early and aspires to pay all undisputed supplier invoices within 10 working days. The Scottish Government purchases some goods and services using the electronic purchasing card, EPC, and payment performance is measured by taking into account both EPC and invoice transactions. For the first six months of the current financial year, i.e. from April to September 2016, the Scottish Government and bodies sharing its financial systems have paid 98.8% of all transactions within 10 working days. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, answer, impressive uh, answer. I welcome the Government's performance on swift payment of bills. Can the Cabinet Secretary update the Parliament on project bank accounts and whether they will be used to support businesses in the construction sector? Cabinet Secretary. Thank uh, Mr Lyle for saying that was an impressive answer. I think it was short and to the point, but it gives a very impressive figure of compliance and achieving those uh, payment targets. But in terms of project project uh, bank accounts. Following the successful completion of the trial programme recommended by the review of Scottish public sector procurement and construction, the Scottish Government has published guidance on the implementation of project bank accounts, PBAs, in construction contracts. And I would encourage their use because I think it is important uh, for subcontractors and the supply chain. Question number eight, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made on the link between taxation policy and small business insolvencies in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government recognises the importance of small and medium-sized businesses to our economic prosperity. As part of our overall approach, we are committed to using the tax powers devolved to the Scottish Parliament to support sustained economic growth. Our small business bonus scheme is, for example, removing or reducing business rates for more than 100,000 premises this year, and we have committed to expand the scheme so that it lifts 100,000 properties out of rates altogether. Edward Mountain. The Minister will be aware of recent insolvency service statistics showing that since the financial crisis hit in 2008, the number of corporate liquidations in Scotland has increased by 21.5%, while falling by 23.1% in England and Wales. Can the Minister please explain the disparity to the Chamber, and can the Minister also explain why the Government's plans to tax businesses an extra £262 million in business rates will help reverse this trend? Cabinet uh, well, I'm happy to check the figures on liquidations and insolvencies because that's not that picture painted is not necessarily the figures I have in terms of corporate insolvencies, and we can't break it down into small businesses, uh, which was the premise of uh, Mr. Mountain's question. So I'm happy to probe that point further. But on the wider point on business rates, we do have the most competitive package of business rates reliefs uh, on these islands, and I want to sustain that as finance secretary of this country. We have the Ken Barclay review, we have matched the poundage, and I would simply point out that the number of small and medium-sized enterprises in Scotland has grown from 148,000 in 2010 to an impressive 163,000 in 2015. Ash Denham. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise on what steps are being taken to give Scottish businesses a competitive advantage over counterparts in other parts of the UK? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'd again refer to the small business bonus, and here's the words of the SFB, the Federation of Small Businesses, who say that the small business bonus continues to give the small 
Uh, the most uh, Scottish small firms a competitive advantage over counterparts in other parts of the UK. So I, I think it shows how valued the uh, small business bonus is and why it should continue. Uh, Claire, sorry, question number nine, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made in the continuity of EU funding in light of Brexit. Cabinet Secretary. EU funding benefits Scotland significantly, supporting jobs, delivering infrastructure, sustaining rural communities, providing valuable support for the farming and fishing industries and delivering research funding for universities. I have personally met with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury on two occasions since the Brexit vote and I have written to him to make clear that the Scottish Government's view on the insufficiency of the original EU funding guarantees that were provided by HM Treasury in August 2016. The UK Government has recently revised its position on EU funding guarantees to cover in full the payment of all EU funding contracts for structural funds, fisheries <laughs> and farming projects that are entered into before the UK proposes to leave the EU, even if the payments extend beyond the Brexit date. I am pleased to confirm today that having considered the detail of the UK Government guarantees, that I will be passing on these guarantees in full to Scottish stakeholders mm -hmm to provide stability and certainty for these key sectors of the Scottish economy. Claire Adamson. Thank you. The University of Edinburgh's principal, Sir Timothy O'Shea, addressed the Scottish Affairs Committee on the 24th of October, warning that Brexit might have a catastrophic consequence on the higher education in the UK, emphasising that one third of the university's research outputs are done in collaboration with other EU countries. What reassurance, if any, is the Cabinet Secretary able to give the science sector on future funding and future access to Horizon 2020 fund? Cabinet Secretary. If I is uh, the member in the Chamber that I've been able to, to pass on the guarantees that, that I have received from UK Government, but there is absolutely no clarity in what happens after that date, and that issue must be pursued with the UK government and it is true to say and I do share those concerns uh, that Brexit does pose a massive threat to, to higher uh, education, research, development uh, and a whole host of other areas and I think that's why it's really important that this government, indeed this parliament, continues to stand up for Scotland. Thank you. That brings us to an end of portfolio questions. Just take a few seconds to change seats. <laughs>